Welcome to um, our final spring 2016 Food for Thought. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, my name is Brianne Roth. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here with the NHA. And if you could all please take a moment to silence your cell phones um, so as to not disrupt today's presentation. Um, as always, um, thank you again for joining us. Um, we would like to recognize that the Food for Thought program is um, made possible in part by the MS Worthington Foundation and that media sponsorship is generously provided by Novation Media. And on to today's speaker, Marsha Butman. Marsha is a member of the fourth generation of her family that has spent their summers on Nantucket and her children and grandchildren make six generations of summering on Nantucket. Growing up, she loved surf swimming and beach picnics, picnics on the South Shore, nature classes at Mariah Mitchell, endless hours on our beach at Sachem Springs swimming, and building dams from the clay and sand on the cliff. Um, she also enjoyed riding her bike downtown to eat H-bomb neutralizers and seeing movies at the Dreamland. Marsha has spent some part of every summer of her life on Nantucket. Marcia grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, and now lives in Lexington, Massachusetts. In 1995, in partnership with METCO, a Boston-based desegregation program busing children of color to suburban communities, she founded Discover Roxbury, which offers tours and programs to highlight the rich history, art, and culture of Roxbury, Massachusetts. She loves making her family history accessible to her family and spends inordinate, inordinate amounts of time sorting through boxes, scanning photos and documents and creating digital books like the one you'll see today. She loves the natural world and has climbed 48 mountains over 4,000 feet in New Hampshire and continues to hike in snowshoe whenever she gets a chance. She's married to Toby Sackton, owner of Seafood, Seafood News Commercial. They have three children and three grandchildren who all love Nantucket. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Marsha Butman. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I just wanted to thank the Nantucket Historical Association for making it possible for me to present this to you. As, I, as Brienne said, I've been sorting through with this stuff for quite a few years, and I'm really excited at what I found. So it's a great opportunity to share it with other people. OK. Um, this is my great aunt, Olive Dame Campbell, who lived from 18, uh, 1862 to 1954. And what I'm going to share with you today is primarily through her eyes. Um, and the reason this is called From Bloomingdale to Cashlot is the first time we really find out what she thought about Nantucket was when she was renting Bloomingdale, which I'm sure most of you now is now the Sconset Golf Course Clubhouse. And in 1918, she and her husband built a small cottage on Hinckley Lane, which if you don't know, Hinckley Lane is a dirt road that runs from Cliff Road down to the um, ocean right opposite what is now the Westmore Inn. Um, so that's why this is called From Bloomingdale to Cashalot. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, how did Olive get to Nantucket in the first place? Well, her, grand, her father, Lauren Lodame, um, was a, uh, he graduated from Tufts, he started teaching, he taught in Braintree, and he married um, Isabel on the right, his um, wife, eight days before he mustered out to fight in the Civil War. When he came back from the Civil War, and you can see this is him in a Civil War uniform, when he came back from the Civil War, he wanted to go to law school, but he didn't really have the funds, so he went back to teaching. And he first taught in Lexington, and from 1867 to 1869, he was the principal of Nantucket High School, which I just totally documented today in the research library. It's written down in um, one of the list of teachers. So um, Isabel and Lauren loved Nantucket, and they, um, but they were looking for, I think, a greater salary. So in 1869, they moved to the mainland. But since he was a, worked in a school, they could come back every summer. So they started returning to Nantucket in the summer, starting right after he left. And they, they really grew to love Nantucket. And they passed this on to their four, four daughters. 
And these are their four daughters, Ruth, uh, sorry, Daisy, Ruth, Isabel, and Olive is on the far right, which we'll hear a lot more about. <clears throat> and luckily, that love has been passed on through the generations to myself and my children and grandchildren. <clears throat> um, just to share with you kind of how I found out all this, this is a diary that Olive wrote from 1908 to 1912. It was a five-year diary that was kind of a line-a-day diary. And I am amazed that we have all this stuff because what happened was when my grandfather died, the house in Medford where they lived, where Lauren Lodame was principal of Medford High School, when the, when the last generation um, to live there died, my mother and my aunt went up to clean everything out, and they went up into the attic, and there was, like, so much stuff up there. I remember I was around 11. There were boxes and boxes of papers and just tons of stuff. They didn't really know what to do with it, so they boxed it up in, in non-archival boxes, I'm sure. They brought it to Nantucket and put it... Um, in the attic of Hinckley Farm, which you'll hear more about in a little while. Now, Hinckley Farm was built in 1844. It's not heated. It's certainly not moisture regulated. And the boxes sat there for close to 25 years. Um, my uncle then decided something had to be done with them. He took them all out of Hinckley Farm. He brought them to Bethesda, Maryland, where he lived. Unfortunately, uh, an archivist friend of his, Jessica Kaplan, who was looking for a very part-time job while her children were really young, he hired her to sort through and catalog everything, which is what she did. Um, and most of it is now at Mass Historical Society. A little bit of it we managed to get to the Nantucket Historic Association. Um, and before it all went, I scanned a lot of the pictures and read through the diaries, and I've also gone back and read through them. And I just can't tell you how moving it was for me to read what my relatives were doing in Nantucket more than 100 years ago. Um, and some of the things that they do, we still do, like go to the South Shore and enjoy the surf, believe in the restorative power of swimming in the ocean, picking blueberries and beach plums, all those activities they did. And um, that was really exciting for me. Honestly, reading the diaries was like a page turner. It was like reading a mystery to me. What are they going to do next? And someplace that I dearly love now, they dearly loved then. So it's been really an exciting experience for me to um, see all these, learn about all this. Okay, why am I focusing primarily on Olive? Now, Olive was a really special woman, although I know it's kind of odd to show a wedding picture to show that someone was special, but just hold on a minute. Olive um, married, well, as a young woman, she went to Tufts at a time when most um, young women did not go to college. She took a cruise to Europe in 1906, she met... John Campbell, on the cruise, they seem to have fallen in love on the boat, and they were married soon after that, um, in March of 1907. Um, John uh, went to Williams College and Andover Theological Seminary. He was a minister, but he had a really great interest in the Appalachian Mountains and in um, improving the lives of the people who lived in the Southern Appalachians, not changing them, but just making their lives more, uh, more easier and, and richer. And, all, and Olive joined him in this pursuit. Hmm. Um, they traveled through the Appalachian Mountains in 1908 and 1909 on horseback and wagon. And Olive was about oh, 24 then. And there's a diary published, this is her diary called Appalachian Travels that's recently been published, which describes every day of this trip in the back, really rough mountains of the Appalachian. He wrote up a report for the Russell Sage Foundation, um, and then they moved south, and John was um, secretary of the Southern Division of the Russell Sage Foundation. Olive collected ballads 
uh, during the time they were traveling in 1908 and 1909. And she did a, such a good job collecting ballads that they were, she collaborated with Cecil Sharp, who was a really well-known English ballad collector, and published a book of ballads in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, this is a picture of Olive and John. He was president of Piedmont College. Um, but they came to Nantucket almost every summer. Um, John died in 1919, and Olive um, founded the John C. Campbell Folk School, which is still going strong today. Um, this originally was a school that was supposed to um, enrich the lives of people in the Appalachian Mountains by providing education. They had a cooperative for um, dairy farmers, and now it still does that to a certain extent, but also provides um, adult education type programs for people all over the country, mostly to learn about Appalachian crafts and actually do them. So she founded this by herself, well, she had a partner, another woman, and ran it from 1925 to 1947. Um, but during that time, I don't know how she managed this, but almost every summer she still came back to Nantucket. Um, and for me, Olive was a really special person because I was, a, I was nine when she died, and I remember her really well. Here's a, a letter that she wrote, that I wrote to her. Dear Aunt Olive, I think you are a very good aunt. I like you very much. Love, Marcia. Um, and also, the name Olive is really important to our family. My mother, Olive Butman, also loved Nantucket dearly, and my daughter, Laura Olive Sackton, also loves it. So now we're going to get back to Nantucket. Um, what did Lauren Lowe Dame and Isabel Arnold Dame, Olive's parents, pass on to their children? Um, well, they love Nantucket dearly. This is a picture of them setting out on a bike ride. Probably, this is in the early 1900s. This is when they lived on Hinckley Farm. Um, and here's what Ruth wrote, Olive's sister. When I think over all that father crowded into his life at Nantucket, I am amazed. <clears throat> He not only collected flowers and helped with Mrs. Owen with a book on Nantucket wildflowers at which she was working, he also studied algae and mounted a large collection. And a little book of that collection is in the Nantucket uh, collection. <clears throat> he knew the stars and the constellations and walked abroad at night under the wide Nantucket horizon. Um, Maria Owen wrote in the beginning of her book, Catalog of Plants Growing Without Cultivation in the County of Nantucket, Mr. Lauren Low Dame of Medford, who was in the habit of spending part of his summers in Nantucket, offered his help at once, and how valuable it proved, the following pages will in some measure show. Mr. Dame's discoveries are so numerous, I have marked them by his initials only, LLD. So he spent a lot of time walking around discovering plants. He, oops. Um, this is a picture of Sacacha and Quidnit quite a long time ago, in the early 1900s. Um, he taught us to swim in the surf and refused to let us go out in a boat or canoe until where we were good swimmers. He took us fishing out on Sacacha. The rule was that we should bait our own hooks and remove the fish unless one of us was unlucky enough to catch an eel when he would come to our assistance. And here's one other journal entry from Lauren Lodame from August 3rd, 1872. This is his description of a trip to Kotu. It was very pleasant skimming the water under a fair wind, coasting along Shimo and Quays to the mouth of Pulpus Harbor, and then standing across to Kotu. We put on our shoes and stockings and walked along the narrow peninsula, listening to the ripple of the waves on either side. Not a very attractive strip of land to the pleasure seeker, but wonderfully so to me, long and narrow and sandy, without vestige of human habitation, save a solitary gunman's hut, probably unchanged for hundreds of years. I feel like that's the one place I could take Lauren Lowe Dame back and he wouldn't be completely horrified. Um, and Isabel loved Nantucket, too, kind of in a little bit of a different way. She was the one that organized things and got them there, found them houses and got them back. She was also a musician, um, but she really loved the ocean. July 27, 1878, had a delightful bath. That's what they called swimming. 
The waves were quite high, and I enjoy that very much more. And here's one more quote from her. July 11th, 1902. As glorious a day as we know tuck it to bestow, and that means much. It was a beautiful day throughout, and the roads were lined with wild roses, daisies, elderberry in full bloom, mustard and swamp pink, and the yellow mullen. So as I read through these diaries, first of all, it's obvious that Lauren, Lauren Lowe Dame and Isabel Arnold Dame passed on their love of Nantucket to their children. And the three things that I found that they really loved about summering on Nantucket was one, the ocean and swimming, both on the South Shore and on the North Shore. Two, um, the, the beautiful, the, the, the natural beauty of Nantucket. And they really reveled in the natural beauty and were always commenting on it. And three, their con the connection to their family and friends, which they did a lot of on Nantucket. Okay. So here we are in Bloomingdale. Um, and if you don't, I'm sure everybody knows where Bloomingdale is, but I just got the book that Chris Harding did for the Land Bank on Bloomingdale. And it is fabulous if you want to know everything about Bloomingdale from the beginning to the end. Um, I'd suggest you read it. But anyway, the Dames rented Bloomingdale in the, early, uh, in the late 1800s. We lived in three different houses in the village and three in the Underhill settlement later and seven years in Bloomingdale, which will always remain the ideal of a summer home to me. This is Ruth writing. A double blessing, Nantucket and our family solidarity. Aunt Og and I awakened in the morning to the chorus of the Bob White and the Meadowlark, went to sleep often when the long blue shadows were creeping over Saul's Hills and the cricket were in full cry. Those hours of daylight between gave us not only the ozone, so popular at the time, and the healthy exercise, but the wise and loving companionship of father and mother and the nearer influence of two grand older sisters. They really loved the house of Bloomingdale. Here's a picture of the six of them. Uh, I can't identify who is who here, but um, I remember how with Helen and Louise Gardner, we used to lie on top of the roof our feet braced against the skylight, our heads above the ridge pole, and shout greetings to the carriages that passed on the road far below. They were like waving to the people going back and forth on the Sconset Road. Olive and Ruth kept a diary in 1896, so Olive was 14 and Ruth was 16. And um, it was called Typical Women of a Modern Regiment. I don't know where that comes from by Ruth Burley Dame and illustrated by Olive Arnold Dame, but they both wrote in it. Um, and I'm gonna show you some pictures that are in it and read some entries in the diary so you get an idea of what two young girls did in Sconset in 1896. My mother transcribed this diary um, in 1992, which was a huge help. Okay, this is Olive um, against the barn, which now doesn't exist, and on the porch. June 27th, 1896, here we are. Arrived last night, Morris met us at the boat. Morris is a young man that plays prominently in their diary this summer. He's rather short, rather round, good looking as to face, brown eyes, brown hair, and beautiful teeth. He's great fun, awfully jolly. I'm glad he will be here all summer. This morning we woke up early. It was foggy, but cleared up and has been lovely all day. We watch Sankety, Tom Never's Barn, Saul's Hills appear through the fog. Then July 1st, 1896, this morning came our first bath. We could wait no longer. After a morning on the beach, we went in. Morris came down, and we three, Morris, Olive, and I, went in. June 28th, 1896. Olive was an artist as well, and in, the, in some of her scrapbooks, she has sketches of Bloomingdale, which will appear as I go along here. Anyway, June 28, 1896. Mars stayed until past eight. We built a fire in the fireplace and boiled water in the tea kettle hanging on the crane. It was very picturesque, but more for show than good, for the tea kettle was rusty. We had tea and cheese and crackers. It was great fun. Here they are beside the pilot house, which probably a Sconset expert here knows where the pilot house is. Anyway, um, 
July 18, 1896, about three o'clock, Morris, Billy, Olam, and I started for Tom Nevers to get some berries. We picked quite a few, then started to try the grounds on Tom Nevers, but we stopped at the pond and went rafting. Olive tried first. She balanced about rather crazily, but finally got into the spirit of the thing and paddled around beautifully. So they were walking from Bloomingdale to Tom Nevers, and this, I'm quite sure, is a photo of the Ford's Palm Nevers from Bloomingdale, and you can just see a little plant of water, which I'm pretty sure is Tom Nevers Pond. I actually discussed this with Peter Dunwitty, if any of you know him, and he thought it was too, so anybody else here can also, all you other experts can. Um, so this is a, a sketch of, the, of Bloomingdale at the time, 1896. July 20th, 1896. We took the road for Tom Nevers, went around the pond, then skirmished about the head for good berry patches. There we found a berry patch of immense size feeding every patch so far this season in size and quantity of berries. I mean, here's the front of the barn. July 21st, 1896, Isabel, Ruth, Papa, and I went in bathing besides Morris. The waves were high and rather choppy. We went out beyond, nevertheless. Papa got a huge boil. He was simply bent double and turned upside down. Ruth got a bad boil, too. I came out safe and happy, and it must be confessed, a little relieved. Yet I wouldn't have missed the high surf for anything. July 26, 1896. Morris and I rode to town in 45 minutes and back in 36. It was one of the best rides I have had yet. And so I don't know if they were riding to Nantucket Town or Sconset, but they're riding to Nantucket Town. That was pretty good for the kind of bikes that they had then. Here's the back of the barn. August 16th, 1896, after a large and substantial dinner, we three girls in Morris played ball a little and then went out for a walk via Bottle Farm. Morris hunted for snakes and spiders, olive for arrowheads, I for huckleberries. Morris found a large black spider covered with small ones, olive, two fine arrowheads, and I enough huckleberries to fill my inner pail. They went out searching for arrowheads quite a bit. One of their favorite places with a beach, and this is a photo of the Sconset Beach. August 5th, 1896, about the best bath yet to match with a glorious day. We had only been in a few minutes when the blue fishing steamer anchored off. We swam out and were hoisted aboard. Ruth and I were the only girls on the boat. Finally, Ruth dived and went flat. It was too bad. Olive was really obsessed with being a good diver. She constantly refers to it. I went after her. Mara said I made a dandy. I don't know about that, but anyhow, I went down, down deep, and the men applauded. Um, okay, this is the final entry for Bloomingdale. This she did. Linaho is another um, cottage in Sconset, I believe. Um, so this is a little composite of all her sketches. August 28th, 1896. In the afternoon, Morris, Olive, and I walked to the highest hill. We struck the wrong one first, but finally ascended the right hill in triumph and set our little feet full joyfully on the surveyor's stone. The view was immense and the day unusually clear. We were pretty tired when we got home, but as usual, played cards all evening. Okay, and then September 8th, 1896, safe home again. This is to Medford. And now I must stop at the end of a lovely summer. So I just picked out a few excerpts from this diary to share with you. Every day is amazing to me. And I think they would have gone back to Bloomingdale every summer. But as we all know, the Sconset Golf Club came um, and I think bought Bloomingdale to make it into a... Um, Olive was not pleased with this at all. And this is a college theme that she wrote um, a few years later called, They have taken away our country house and turned it into a golf house. They have painted the name of their club on its mossy gray shingles. They have boarded up the huge old fireplace with a black crane and swinging kettle in which we boiled many a time our molasses candy. Their bicycles lean against the sagging fence 
and their red flags wave through the 40-acre lot. Their scarlet jackets and sunbonnets clamber over the rough style. But still there come clearly before me the long summers spent there, those still dark evenings lying on the rolling terrors with no light to brighten the absolute darkness but the moon, no sound but the eternal murmurings of the distant sea and the croaking of the frog. frogs. Miles before us lay the dim moors sending out their fragrance on the cool night wind, stretching to the lonely sea, glimmering brightly in the path of the moon's rays. And we sat in silence looking out while the smoke of my father's pipe drifted slowly upward and seemed to lose itself in the bright starry sky. Anyway, fortunately for us, they turned to the North Shore. And this is a, this is a picture of Cliff Road, which is amazing to me. Anyway, um, so every summer when they came to Nantucket, they didn't know where they were going to stay until they got here. Um, and this is Isabel, July 19th, they're all of us mother, July 19th, 1901. Arose at 4 a.m. and the house was soon stirring. Ruth, Olive, and myself took electric. We're in South Station by 25 of 7 a.m., starting at 5 of 6. Everything went well. We took carriage. We rode by several residents in Cliff till we came to a dear little cot by itself. Here's the dear little cot. Way down a lane, we were delighted with interiors and were soon unpacked. This really gave me the chills when I read this entry because this, bar, this house, Hinckley Farm, has been lived in by my family since Isabel discovered it in 1901. So this is her discovery. Um, we wandered farther down the lane to the water. Ruth took her first bath. It was a delightful spot. Huh. Um, so Hinckley Farm was built by Evan Hinckley as a farmhouse in 1844. And when the dames first encountered it, they rented it from 1901 to 1912. And then Isabel, after Lauren died, bought it in 1912. And she said to her girls, this is the best thing you're, I'm going to do for you. Your children and grandchildren, are thank you. And indeed, we did. <clears throat> and here is a view that they saw from Hinckley Lane across the moors to town, which is so different from what it looks like now. I often wish that I could time travel back to Nantucket in the early 1900s, because there was just nothing there. So beautiful. OK, so this next part, um, I'm going to share a little bit about what Olive did when she was at Hinckley Farm. So she was a young woman, um, just gra have, having graduated from Tufts. Then she married John, and she and John were in Hinckley Farm. and then. She had a baby, and they spent time in Hinckley Farm. Um, this, is a, this is her five college friends. Whoops. And this is Isabel, her mother's entries. July 3rd, 1902, six college girls, and they make the rafters sing. So she was kind of excited about these girls when they came. July 7th, 1902, a lovely morning, but we had a very late breakfast, for the girls had to go down and get provisions. Just getting a little... July 9th, 1902, felt rather disgusted with a shiftless housekeeping of girls. And after my bath, I decided I would leave them. With wheel, I went to Sconset. So she escaped the six college girls and rode out to Sconset. July 12th, 1902, the girls went off in a great crowd this morning, and Olive and I were not sorry. We made a big change in the looks of things, but it took us all day long. So we've all felt that, really happy to have house guests, but also really happy when they leave. And that was no different then. As I said, they all love the ocean. This is a photo of them swimming when they're the whole family. So Lauren, Low Dame on the left, then Daisy, Isabel, Ruth, and Olive on the far right, and Isabel, um, their mother. I'm just going to read a couple quotes. They always said they were taking a great bath, and they always observed you know, the quality of the water, and they wrote it down in their diaries. So I'm just going to read a couple. This is Olive writing, June 30th, 1908. Water clean and ruffled. Did a deal of swimming underwater and diving. July 18th, 1910. Windy, sea rough and wavy, yet Daisy and I swam bravely. 
This one kills me. October 3rd, 1910, had a cold but invigorating dip. And I think that's where I get the idea that it's morally wrong if you don't go into the ocean, no matter what the temperature. Um, you're always supposed to do that. But I did not bring my bathing suit today. <laughs> um, one more. July 15th, 1911, all crowd in swimming, water calm and warm. Perfect. September 28th, 1911, brilliant, cold north wind, sea dark blue and foaming. Um, now, at the end of Hinkley Lane was Sachem Spring, which was a very popular place to go and get water and hang out. And so I have a few pictures of the spring, which is no longer there. This is the top of the cliff going down to the spring. This is... Um, Ruth on the left and Olive on the right at the top of the cliff. This is Lauren Lodame walking down. And my understanding is at one time you could actually drive a wagon down the cliff to the spring. And you can see the ruts in the path. Um, this is the four, well, a couple of the girls, Isabel, I'm not sure who else. And this is the way the spring looked um, in the early 1900s, so you could really get water out of it. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is Ruth and Olive. Olive on the left and Ruth on the right. Um, and it looks like they went down to get water, and the water was so inviting, they went in with their dresses on because their dresses look really wet. Um, and here they are walking back up the spring with their pail. Is where I am now? Um, so they not only swam, but at that time they, did, they crabbed on the North Shore. Um, this is what Olive says. July 27th, 1910. In the evening, all went crabbing, wading in warm low tide. Great sport and 12 crabs. I'm assuming these are, my husband's a seafood expert. He said these are probably blue crabs. Okay, the other thing that they did that really struck me was they walked everywhere. They were constantly taking walks. They thought nothing of walking over to the South Shore and back for the day. Um, and this is a group of them. Olive is the one in the foreground with the curly hair. July 6, 1911, John and I, with Lizzie and Mabel, spent day at South Shore. Lovely walk and fine bath. Hilarious time. All pretty badly burned. August 26, 1908, Northeaster, sure enough, Pouring rain and high wind, Lizzie, John, and I donned all waterproof we had and walked to South Shore by father's side of Hummock. So they were walking over to the South Shore in a northeaster. Wonderful coloring and a heavy battle with a storm. I got drenched to the skin and shook with the cold all the way. Spent p.m. over an open fire with reading and sausages. Um, they also... Uh, a group of them walked around the island, or at least part of the island. It was John and Olive who were married, Lizzie and Mabel, their friends who were sisters, and Olive's sister Ruth and her fiancé Richard, and they weren't married, so I thought this was pretty liberated. They spent two nights out camping on the beach. They went from Hinkley Farm to Quidnet, from Quidnet to um, Sconset, from Sconset to Tom Nevers on the first day, then they slept out at Tom Nevers. The second day they walked from Tom Nevers. I can't identify exactly where it is, but it's somewhere close to Madiket. And on the third day, they walked from Madiket home. And what's interesting is this was a tradition in our family for a little while. My um, uncle, Brad Coolidge, and Granger Frost, his great friend, walked around the island when they were like 14 and 15. And my brother... John Butman and his cousin Oliver also walked along, around the island, but it's kind of died in the generation after that. Um, and this is, this is Reed Pond, which if you don't know where it is, it's on the North Shore right um, to the east of Tuppensee. Um, August 11th, 1908. In PM, John and I walked over to Old Farm by Kapam, home via Reed Pond, collecting a bushel of green apples, mushrooms, a puffball, and several quarts of cranberries. Also found hibiscus in bloom, beautiful, bloom beautiful. On these walks, um, as we already discovered, Olive was an artist, and she made some sketches 
of houses that are not there anymore. And I'm just going to show you a few of them. These are all in the research library. In the center of Hummock Pond on the island, which we think is the peninsula, um, apparently deserted, used by gunners in shooting season. Here's the next one. George Robinson House. Father Ruth and I stop on our return from a tramp. Wait, sorry, I skipped that one. Um, this is um, Ben Coffin shows us over the interior, very picturesque with the largest chimney piece I have seen. Millbrook Farm, 1724, Gilbert Coffin Place, she writes on this. And Betsy, I think, knows where this is. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and the last one, Pocoy Farm, which is the, Pocoy is on the east side of Hummock, I think. Um, which I think Bartlett still farms the land there. Pocoy Farm on east side of Hummock. Desert of, I don't know what this is, tales, tacked up within. Many copies of mass agricultural strewn about. Okay. Um, I have one more college theme that's in line of the tramps that they did. This is called Hummock Pond. And as you can see, the original is on the right. Um, and I can just envision them standing there. And what is that, we ask, turning to where a gleam of water peeped between masses of sturdy reeds, whose tall tops eddied in changing depths of color as the wind bowed them low. That, responded my father, stretching his arm to the eastward, that is Hummock Pond. But there to the north, where the sandbank shadows the water, what is that? That, said my father, is the head of Hummock Pond. But look to the south, what is that? And see, there is still water to the west. For an instant, my father was silent. Then sweeping his arm about the whole horizon, he answered in one comprehensive word, hummock. No, no, surely not hummock, but long, we answered, quite innocent. But he shook his head, while a lonely turn, sweeping low, seemed to protest shrilly against the imputation. And far off at the edge of the narrow sandbar, the ocean pounded in sullen roar, hummock, hummock, as if eager to break the slender wedge and claim those calm waters about us for its own. Okay, so they didn't just walk around. They also hung out with their family and uh, lay on their hammock uh, in front of Hinkley Farm. And these are just a few photos of them hanging out. This is um, Olive, Standing, Isabel, and Ruth. This is a whole group of them. And the man sitting with his arms crossed is Henry Wire, who is a good friend of theirs, who was an artist who had an art store in town. And this is John, Isabel, and Olive on the, on the side of Hickley Farm. OK, um, John and Olive had a baby, Jane, in 1912. And Jane spent from June to November in Nantucket. Um, and she was christened at Hinckley Farm. This is a picture of the christening. Uh, unfortunately, Jane did not thrive the whole time of her life. She was born at six pounds, and she died at about eight pounds in February. And I've transcribed the journal of her entire life from when she was born to when she died. And you know, six months of it was on Nantucket, which is really interesting. Um, it's a really heartbreaking story, but we're not going to go into that. Um, that's for another time. Okay, the final stage is Cashelot. Um, so Olive and John had been talking about building a little cottage of their own, and they had their eyes on this barn. Um, by July, this is the summer of 1918. By July, we were settled quietly in Nantucket, first in a rented cottage near our old family farmhouse, and then in a little hay barn, which we had long coveted, and now, unexpectedly, we're able to buy at the exorbitant price of $75. This was a barn on, on Betsy Tyler did some great research for us on Cashelot. This was a barn that was on the Flag Root Pond lot. And I just found out from Fran, the Flag Root Pond is still there. It's on the um, south side of Cliff Road, around, what? On Westchester, the north side of Westchester, sorry. Um, 
So they had this, oh, so it was owned, the lot was owned by Thomas Hamlin, and he sold it to his brother, John Hamlin, who Olive and John bought the barn from. Um, on this one, if you really look closely, you can make out Cliff Road to the left of the barn. So this is in its original location. Um, raised on stilts and conveyed majestically over the field to the shelter of Hinckley Farm, this became the center of our, of our concern and effort for the rest of the time. Hmm. Not only did the family help to pound and paint as soon as it was settled into its appointed place, but all visiting friends joined in covering the raw surfaces as fast as the carpenters provided them. Fortunately for us, it was, com it was a comparatively dull summer at Nantucket. Few people dared to face the risk of submarines because it was during World War I, and the usual brisk building activities were at a standstill. I often wonder what Olive would think if she came back today. Um, and this is the septic system being put in, labeled the crucial moment. So began the cash lot, as we called it, for the barn was constructed of heavy shipwreck timber, and the old sailor who built it had sailed before the mast on the good ship cash lot, cash lot out of New Bedford, mortalized in Frank Bullen's The Cruise of the Cash Lot. So I don't know if this picture is of Thomas, who actually did uh, sail on the ship cash lot, and his log is in the research library, or if it's his brother, John. And this is a family myth that I don't know if we're ever going to be able to figure out. But anyway, because Thomas died in 1918 when they were building the cottage. This is what it looked like a few years later after it was done. And here it is on Hinckley Lane. So you can see what Hinckley Lane looked like in 1918. That's my mother in the front, the little girl, and that's the Hinckley Farm and the cottage. And um, John was really hoping to come back, um, and he loved Cash a lot, and he loved the carpentry work he did, but John was in poor health himself, and he died on their way to Nantucket the next summer. So he was never able to return and see this view. This is another view. I can only think that this is Cliff Road because Hinckley Farm, you can see the water tower, you can see Hinckley Farm in the back there, and you can see Cashalot right next to it. Um, so after John's death, Olive continued um, coming to Nantucket, and she invited a lot of friends and family who came to Cashalot almost every summer. I've got some pictures of the interior of Cashalot for. This is the entries they put in the log. They really loved it. It was a very simple cottage. I don't know what this means. I don't know. There's an upstairs where you could look at. I don't know if there were bootleggers coming into the North Shore at that time. Maybe there were. And uh, Olive always had tea in the afternoon. And here she is later on in life, getting ready to serve tea, which I can remember. Okay, so just quickly to end, um, after John died, she never married again, but she, I, she loved Nantucket dearly. I think she, she spent all her winters at the folk school in Brathtown, North Carolina, but I think she got a lot of sustenance from coming back to Nantucket, and she still did all the regular things. This is, you can't really tell, but this is a picture of her in, at the South Shore. Oh, sorry, that's, oh, I'm sorry, I missed something. She finally moved the cash lot one more time. She, she bought some land from um, Hallowell behind Hinckley Farm and moved the cash lot so that it had a beautiful view of the ocean. This is its final resting place. Um, so here she is at the South Shore. Here she is at Sachem Springs with her nieces and nephews. This is my mother's christening. So you can see she really hung out with her family and friends who are great support. This is Olive on the left, down at the beach, the far left, with her nieces. And um, my uncle, Brad Coolidge, is the young boy, and Granger Frost right next to him. And here they are. This is on the North Shore, right below Tuppensee, because it looks exactly like that today. And they all seem to wear shirts and ties, whatever they did. Olive is the woman in the, to the right with the white hair. 
And here they are on the porch of Hinckley. Olive sitting down um, on the far left. And here is me and my Aunt Olive down at the beach in like 1951 or so. Okay, this is a photo, of, just to wrap up, this is a photo of the way Cachalot looked through the 60s. Um, but this is a good news, bad news story. Um, my aunt was very generous. She gave a piece of land to my mother and father, part of the Hallowell land, and we, we built a small cottage on it. And she gave the Cachalot to her five nieces, who um, she didn't have anybody to give it to. And, so she gave it to her five nieces, and everything went really well in their generation. But in the next generation, there were 22 people owning the cash lot. And that did not work out well. There were some disagreements, and they were forced to sell the house. And this is what's in its place. Um, oops, sorry. Oh, good, I don't want to. That's what's in its place now, unfortunately. However, there's a good news part to this story. Um, you know, the cash lot could not be torn down because it was a historic cottage. It could have been merged into this lot, but um, my cousins, the Coolidges, had the cash lot move for the fourth time. And... It is resting on their, on the Hinckley Farm lot, just behind Hinckley Farm. Um, and it looks almost exactly the same as it did when Olive lived in it. They put a little addition on the um, front so the kitchen can be a, li a little bit larger. And so this is enjoyed by the fifth and sixth generation of our family. And that is it. Does anyone have any questions um, for Marcia? Any questions? Fantastic. Well, um, let's have one more round of applause. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you all for coming out to Food for Thought. Um, we still have Yoga at Greater Light going on on Saturdays in April. So come check out Yoga at Greater Light if you'd like. Thank you all. <laughs>